Uh, my name is Paul Dolan. Um, this is an evening in the, in the number three. So there's going to be lots of threes. First of all, there's three of us. Thankfully, you're not going to hear too much from me. I'm going to introduce Dame Shirley and Saadi Lalu and do that very quickly. There's a lot that I could say about both of them. Uh, I don't like speaking to notes, so I'm only going to do it from what's in my head, which means that there will only be three things about each of them. And then Saadi will talk about installation theory, which comes in three parts. Uh, and then after the talk, there will be a Q&A session chaired by Dame Shirley. So that's the third part of this evening. First part is uh, letter three, PBS, Psychological and Behavioural Science. That's the, that's the host of this evening's uh, show. And I'm the new head of that department, um, thankfully, or not. Um, and it's an attempt to bring together academics across the LSC, uh, and all of those interested in understanding and changing human behaviour. And so who's not interested in that? Um, and one of the things that we are especially interested in doing is taking evidence from the lab into the field and back from the field into the lab again. And Saadi is a great example of that in his personal life. No, actually, that's a bit wrong. I didn't mean it, I didn't mean it quite like that. Um, in his professional life, um, in the sense that he started out in an academic institution um, in the French Center for or the Research in Consumption and Social Policies, and then went to EDF, French energy company, um, to head up a lab in design and cognition. Mm -hmm. See, I've been reading the bios. And then um, came to the LSE in 2009 as a chair in social psychology. Um, this is actually not in the number three. This is his fifth book, uh, which is in three parts, in installation theory, which is the physical, the psychological, and the, and the institutional. I won't take too much more away than that. Um, so that side is going to give that book talk. Um, and Dame Shirley will chair. So Dame Shirley, what can I say about her? Well, the first thing I have to remember is this Dame Commander of the Order of the British Empire. <laughs> Doesn't that sound amazing? Isn't it? You know, the days when we, when we ruled the world and ruled the waves. That's a fantastic, that's a fantastic title. I, I, um, um, so Dame Shirley um, was a clinical psychologist by background um, and has done many things, including being, I think, in, in serving as minister in four times in three government departments, which I think is quite extraordinary, um, and has been vice-chancellor of Loughborough University before coming here as chair of court and council. Um, CBE in 2015 and became a dame in 2000, uh, 2005. Uh, five, five. No, no, I'll just so you know. Um, and uh, a dame in 2014. So that's it. That's all I have to say by way of introduction. Welcome and thank you for coming. Um, I'm sure you're going to have a very interesting evening. I should also say that, um, that there's a drinks reception afterwards. Um, and I've been told that that's somewhere different to where I thought it was. So where, where is that now? In the senior common room. In the senior common room. So, sorry? Fifth floor, thank you. So, the fifth floor of the senior common room. Thank you very much and welcome. Sadi, over to you, sir. Oh, no, Dame Shaw, no, sorry. Dame Shaw. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. Uh, wrong right at the last. Thank you. Th thank you so much, Paul, for that um, very warm in introduction. And I'd like to add my uh, words of welcome. Um, as a clinical psychologist, I'm really excited by this book and I'm really excited by what we're going to hear this evening. It's a, one of the great privileges of being on the council here is being able to be part of, um, but not have to do any of the work, of some just amazing things. And LSE is justly known for the fantastic work it does for the betterment of society. That's a sort of strap line that goes right back to the beginnings of the organization and the institution. And I really think that what we're going to hear about tonight is the distillation of a whole set of really complex ideas, and that's what LSE is just great at, pulling together different disciplinary influences on a really tricky societal problem. And the framework that we're going to hear about today um, really is a step in the direction of providing a framework for the betterment of society, because we don't well, we'll probably come into this in the questions, but from a clinical psychology perspective, I can see a framework here which has implications for therapeutic benefit as well as the understanding of normal, whatever that might be, uh, behavior. So it's a huge pleasure to be here. I really look forward to he hearing your questions. Um, and I'm going to hand over now to Sari, who's going to give us his lecture, and then I will return 
uh, to uh, chair this, the questions in a bit. Sadi, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you, Paul. Thank you, Shirley, for this great introduction. Thank you all uh, for coming tonight. Uh, I, I really appreciate to see so many faces of friends, of people I know have come from a long way. And um, it's really great to be here. Um, so I must say 6.30 6 is not a good time for a conference. I'm, I'm aware that many of you had had to uh, come through the tube uh, with something which is rather unpleasant, something like that, because you're nice people, you probably uh, complied very well, you did uh, politely not step on your uh, neighbor's feet, and uh, went uh, through uh, the whole uh, process to arrive here, uh, although you probably would have preferred uh, something uh, nice uh, in terms of travel. But as we, as we all know, in society, we don't we don't always do exactly what we want. Um, I don't mean that, that, that we do things we don't want. It's a bit of a, it's a, bit of a gray zone. Uh, we do act of our own behalf, um, but in a situation where we don't fully control the process and we feel the decision is not entirely ours. Uh, so that's a gray zone where we're not deprived of our free will. Uh, nevertheless, we're framed. And, uh, we have chosen to be here, we voluntarily comply, but at the same time we feel channeled, okay? So to take the words that Milgram used to describe his experiment on, on uh, authority, we, we are integrated into a situation that has a momentum of its own. So why does this happen? Um, why does this happen all the time? If you've taken the plane uh, recently, which is probably the case of, of many of you since LSE is so diverse and uh, international, you may have noticed that from the moment that you stepped in to check in till the moment that on the other end at the other airport you, you took your luggage, you probably had very few decisions that were your own, except perhaps the choice of the drink in the plane. Okay? You were channeled all the way. Um, and interestingly, other people in the plane who were different in terms of nationality, age, gender, beliefs, uh, still acted the same. You all acted very similarly as uh, airline passengers, right? Um, and so most of our lives, we, we do live in this sort of channeled uh, mode, like in the traffic, uh, where you, you more or less go where you want to go, but not exactly the way you would like to. So societies do channel humans into appropriate behavior. And if you think for a second, from the moment that you woke up this morning until you arrived here tonight, at how long you were in such channeled states, well, perhaps you will realize that most of your awake life in public places is lived in such a state. So life is a journey, but perhaps life is a channel journey. Um, and I'll give you some examples. Uh, this is a reception, this is a staircase, this is going to the toilet, queuing, even this conference room, all are examples of channeled states and situations where you act in a predictable way. And as a matter of fact, from cradle to grave, a lot of your life is spent in that state. What I argue tonight is that channel behavior is actually one solution to two very big problems of social science. Um, fluid operation and endurance of society, problem one, societal problem, governance. And the second one is the determination of individual behavior. Obviously, if you want a society to work, to operate smoothly, you want people to behave in a predictable way. So channeled behavior is a very easy solution to the issue of what it is to govern, to manage, to regulate. But you may ask, why is determination of individual behavior a problem? Um, well, it is a problem, and I'll, I'll explain to you what it is. But before doing that, I, I want to say that, as a matter of fact, these two big questions are 
two faces of the same coin. And there are two faces of one coin, which is the societal construction and regulation of behavior. Because on the one hand, your behavior is channeled, and that solves the societal problem. And on the other hand, it solves the determination of individual behavior. And this problem is actually more complex than it seems. The way we decide to do something in our complex societies, considering the fact that we are cognitively limited, uh, is not so trivial. And the societal problem, which is the other face of the coin, is difficult also precisely because we're cognitively limited, but also because we're self-centered, emotional, territorial, aggressive, and more generally, we are primates and we're born with a Stone Age mind. Because as you know, we have the same brain as these cavemen pictured here. The difference is education. So why is it a problem, the determination of individual behavior? It's a problem because as uh, Miller showed in his famous paper on uh, seven plus minus two, the magic number, we can only uh, process a very small number of symbolic information. Our working memory only contains uh, seven plus minus two items, okay? And with this equipment, which is not very powerful as a processor, we have to solve problems like this, which is how to get a green card uh, in the US, um, an easy one. Uh, but still, we, we, we manage to, uh, to do things like going into space, uh, managing the internet, uh, or cities, okay? Very, very complex system, which we do manage with um, primates like us. And to do this, we need to have individuals have predictable behaviors. They must behave appropriately to the circumstances. That is the problem of management. So we need to have people being as apt as these two acrobats on an everyday basis. Should any person mess up at some point in the traffic and it's an accident? And there are very few accidents. Do you know how many accidents there are in Germany or in the UK? Less than five fatalities per billions vehicle kilometer traveled, okay? This means that statistically you could drive for more than 1,100 years before getting a fatal accident statistically. Okay, and this is what societies do, and it's a miracle. And what I am suggesting tonight, and I'm going to try to demonstrate this, is there is a device that enables to solve these two aspects of societal uh, management and individual behavior determination, and this is installations. And that's the topic of my talk. A new unit that enables us to analyze both sides of the coin and their dual relationship. This is my outline. First, the problem of behavior in society. Then I'm going to talk about a new technique that uh, has been used to study behavior and come up with the things I'm reporting tonight. Then I will describe uh, what are installations, how they operate, how they reproduce society, and then finally, how we can use them to change behavior, which is an urgent problem for all of us currently in our uh, jeopardized culture and civilization. So let's go to the first behavior in society. As a matter of fact, I managed to sneak that in the introduction because we've just done it. Uh, the gist of it is simply that uh, societies channel humans into appropriate behavior. And that channel behavior, as I said, is a solution to a dual problem, fluid operation and endurance of society and determination of individual behavior. So that was a quick one. Now, a new technique to observe and to study behavior. Why am I um, describing this? Well, the claim that I'm having here is, is enormous, right? Uh, it's outrageous. I'm pretending that I am bringing you uh, elements to solve two of the major problems of social science. So. Uh, I mean, my natural reaction if I was sitting in your place would be like, oh, what, what, I'm, that, that guy's crazy, John. Let's go. We're wasting our time. This doesn't make sense. Okay. So I'm going to tell you that I have some good arguments to uh, ground what I'm telling you. And these arguments, are, I've, I've was lucky enough to have data that nobody had before. 
and I'm going to show you how these data were collected. But first, I would like to make a little point about the difference between behavior and activity. Behavior is what people do seen from the outside. Uh, behavior is an external description by an observer of objective phenomena. Activity is different. Activity is what people do, so it includes behavior, but it's how, what they do and how they make sense of it seen from their own perspective. So activity is goal-oriented, it is subjective. It's the same thing, but seen from the actor's perspective. And as people, we are interested in experience, and experience is the result of activity. And of course, therefore, as psychologists, we would be interested in studying that experience and that activity. But to do this, we will have to study more than behavior. Behavior is very important to study. We have to do it. And actually, uh, the best way to predict future behavior is to look at past behavior. But if you want to understand the causes of behavior, you need to study activity. You need to know why people do something and how they feel about it, okay? And this is especially the case if you want to cause new behavior, because then you cannot rely on past behavior for predictions. So CB, subjective evidence-based ethnography, goes in two steps. The first one is the capture of behavior, what people did. But it does it from the subject's perspective. We do this with miniature video cameras. The second step is to try to understand how people make sense of what they're doing, and we analyze the actions step by step with the participants to understand the determinants of the activity as they occur. And interestingly, because we get back into the perception action loop of the, of the actor, this triggers episodic memory, that is the multimodal memory that you constituted during action, and participants are able to come up with very detailed and accurate, and this is a, a checkable, accurate description of what they did and of what they thought at the moment. This is the device that we're using, a very small video camera here that we put on, on, on people, right, that we, we stick there. And um, I will show you what kind of data you get from this, which is rather different from what we get from a third-person perspective. So I'm going to show you a very short film of, uh, I think, 50 seconds of a receptionist doing a reception of a, of a guest. And we will see this film twice, or we will see rather this situation twice, one from a third-person perspective with a fixed camera that was in the hall, and then from the subcam that was worn by the participant, by the receptionist in that case. So let me do this. have an appointment with Mr. So-and-so. Please sit down. <clears throat> so she calls the man, says his guest is there. Okay, very simple, not very interesting, but let us now look at the exact same situation, same scene, now from the perspective of the receptionist. Mm -hmm. 
Monsieur Sorin, vous pouvez faire en haut l'escalier. Bonne journée. So you see the kind of material that you get. You probably noticed that the feeling of time was different in the two films. You probably also noticed that you could feel much more sympathy with the actor, hearing her breathing, her tone of voice. And you also see all the elements that are taken into account into her actions, which, which you couldn't see from a third person perspective. And therefore, with the focus of attention, you're able to see what is relevant for action at that moment. But most important, what we do then is that we start looking at the tape with the participant. I won't go into the detail, but what happens is that when the participants see the film from their own perspective, all their memory comes back with great detail. Perhaps you've had this feeling, sometimes you're at home, you go to the dining room for doing something, and then you forgot why the hell did you come here? What was it? But then maybe you notice if you step back to the kitchen or wherever you come from and do that again, suddenly the memory comes back, okay? Because memory is multimodal. It's connected with your perception action loop, with your movements, and we get that same effect, and we get an incredible amount of detail. I'll show you an example. This is... Uh, uh, um, what happens during the replay interview. We look step by step at everything that's been done, and then we ask the person, what happened at that moment? What was relevant? Why did you do this? What, what did you think? Okay? Let me show you one uh, extract, which comes in such a replay interview. Uh, from uh, here, this is uh, an anesthetist, and she this is actually from a, a, a simulation case. They're working on robots, not on real people in that case, but the robots are so realistic that they have to stop before the, the patient dies to avoid uh, trauma on, on the, the, the people who have been trained here. But so what um, that person is describing is a problem that she had during uh, trying to do um, um, an intubation of a patient. And I'll let you listen. But uh, please note how detailed and accurate the remembrance of the parameters, which vary all the time during the session, are at that moment with that person. Okay, so the person actually relives the situation, right? Lives that again. Same subject, same context, same perspective, the memory of the event, no time pressure, and we get a very detailed reenactment and recall. And this is what psychology has been looking for for about a century. We abandon introspection because of a series of technical problems. It seems that those are solved. This is a new era to understand what's happening in the mind during action. Okay? And here, we're accessing what happens during action in the real world. We don't have to do that in the lab. We don't have to go in the scanners. Right? And we've been using that technique since uh, 1998, my colleagues and I, in very diverse situations, which I'm all using as examples in the book. Shopping, creativity, uh, industrial maintenance in, in plants, uh, policing, uh, using the actual recordings from the police. Uh, civil service in Colombia, vocational training, professional cooks, nuclear plant operation, and a lot of other stuff, right? Uh, I will not go into the detail. Some of the people who've been doing that research are here tonight in that room. Some of these research are rather short, it's just a few months for uh, uh, master's uh, degrees, uh, like, uh, I don't know, energy and water waste at home. Uh, Sofia Mutinelli uh, uh, gave the subcamp to 13 uh, families and they, they, they recorded everything and she did, looked in detail at what happens during the waste of water or, or energy. People were 
uh, horrified at seeing how much they waste, but now we know what happens in their mind and why they're wasting, for example. Okay, somewhere longer, like these workplace studies, I'll call, talk a little bit more later about it. This is a tenure uh, uh, of experiments of a whole building that I constructed for full observation 24 seven, that cost million, that was at ADF, and we designed a lot of systems there. But what I want you to see is that CB provides an unprecedented access to behavior and to activity, microscopic data on real action in context. It enables understanding activity and experience, right? And this is something new. We are all, all scientists, we're just uh, dwarfs sitting on the shoulders of giants. But sometimes we're lucky enough to have some new technologies that enable us to have a little bit more data. And this is what happened. So this is why I dare tonight proposing some explanations to old issues that are new explanations. And I will present you this uh, new unit of analysis uh, installations. Okay, so you've seen that uh, my colleagues and I have been observing uh, with that technique a lot of very different activities at home, at work, in, in uh, public places. And we asked people for their goals, for the determinants of action. And what turns out is that we have roughly three types of determinants. Material affordances, embodied competences, and social regulations. And what happens is that these components operate as a bundle. And I'm going to try to detail how this happens. What I call installation is a specific local societal setting where humans are expected to behave in a predictable way. This is an installation. We are in an installation for a conference right now, okay? An installation consists of a set of components that support and control individual behavior. And these components assemble at the time and place the activity is performed. This is the tricky part. We're not used to having such strange units that sort of uh, coalesce at the moment of delivery. We can see that in chemical reactions, but in social science, we're not used to do this. Let me give you an example. These are not natural behavioral units. We call this a reception. We call this a conference. This is a bundle, okay? The components are distributed over three completely different layers. The physical space of you know, affordances of objects, right? In the inner space of the body, your embodied competences, representations, and skills that enable you to interpret situations. And in the social space, where behavior is socially regulated by rules, by other people, and what we call institutions in general. Let's look at these three layers in more detail. Perhaps you're familiar with the notion carved by James Gibson of objects affordances. Gibson says that roughly the affordances of things are what uh, they furnish for good or ill, uh, what they afford the observer um, in the sense that they're properties of the environment and these are relative to the subject, to the animal. Affordances do not cause behavior, but they constrain or control it. Let me give you an example. This is a very, very high step. None of you, I think, can consider this as a step. It's too high. What is a climbable step? Well, Warren looked at that. He showed steps of different sizes to, to people and asked them, I mean, is this climbable? Okay. Now, there is a biomechanical limit of what is a climbable step, and that biomechanical limit is 0.88 of the height of your leg. Okay. Now what happens is that when you ask people to evaluate these stairs, what is the result? 0.88. People are able to see immediately whether they can or they cannot go up that step. And their evaluation is accurate. Gibson says, we perceive immediately objects through their affordances. We, are, we know what we can do with them. We know what they can do with us, okay? That's what's an affordance. You can immediately see this has the affordance of being eaten, this has the affordance of being seated on, okay? That's the idea. Very low level interpretation, immediate. But now you have um, more complex things, psychology, all right? Representation and other embodied skills that enab enable us to interpret uh, situations and objects. 
these are embodied competences. This is, uh, do you see what this is? If I tell you it's a train station, would you agree? Yeah? I hate when I'm asked in conferences, like, you know, uh, as, as a member of the public, I like to be quiet, and, you know, and when the guy there on, on, on the stage asks something, like, could you raise your hands? I hate that, right? But I mean, here, it's important that, that, that you get aware of something. Could you please raise your hands, the guys in the room who agree that this is a train station? All right. Isn't that amazing? You've never been there, right? It's a complex setting. You all know what this is. What is this? T. All right. We can immediately interpret this, all of us, right? Now, this is, <laughs> this is a miracle, right? I mean, seriously, this is a social representation. We all have this same idea. We come from different countries, different history. We all know this, all right? If I ask you, what is this? What is this? What is this? You all know, okay? That is unbelievable, right? Okay? This guy has no idea about this. This is just cultural construct, but we all share it. Can you imagine that all the computers in LSE would have the same things in the memory, the same operating system and, and the same content in the memory? That was a dream of a computer scientist, this sort of IT services. Never happens. But it happens that you take a set of random people and they all know what is T, what is train station. Miracle. How does it happen? Installation. I explain to you how this happens. It's not just about concepts. It's embodied competencies. A lot of us here know how to drive a car. It's even officially certified by a driving license. We don't share everything, but we share a lot of embodied competencies. I guess that a lot of you don't know what this is. Uh, well, right, that, that's a laryngoscope. That's something that, that, that the doctor in the previous video was trying to insert to see uh, inside, but she couldn't because the guy was like that with the throat uh, locked, okay? But more generally, we share a lot of things. Now, not everything we do is affordable or thinkable. There's another thing that will restrict what we actually do like, I mean, I could dance on the stage, get naked, be in the corner. I don't do this, right? Um, actually, there are a series of institutions, series of rules that limit my behavior, social rules, okay? Hamilton's definition is quite nice. So it says the cluster of usages uh, of which a function is to set a pattern of behavior and to fix a zone of tolerance for an activity. This is what society tells us. There's some things you can do, some things you can't. There are rules, social rules. And these social rules uh, will be reminded to you if you don't apply them, okay? If you don't behave correctly or appropriately, um, you will be reminded that this is not the way uh, we operate here. We have all learned to queue, for example, when we wait. First in, first out, okay? Right. And there are many examples of societal regulations. We apply them all the time. We apply a lot of them right now here, right? And they go much deeper than it seems at, at first hand. You see this, this police officer here uh, stopping the traffic to let our friends cross in the zebra crossing. Uh, her reflective vest is actually the result of a lot of institutions. It's conformed to the European norm for high visibility standards, to all these directives, all sorts of specifications. So we see that these three layers can be redundant. We can find a trace of rules in material objects and of course in embodied in people because we're aware of these rules. I'll come back to this. But anyway, the idea is that wherever we go in our action, there will be three layers that scaffold but also constrain what we can do. Physical affordances. We cannot do what is not physically possible, okay? I cannot step in one step over here. I cannot fly in the air. Then there's what is thinkable. My embodied competence is how I interpret things. Right? That limits, again, what is possible. It's now the intersection of these two things. And among all this, there are things that are socially allowed and others that aren't. That also limits what I can do. So what is left, a small intersection, right? 
And that's what the sustainable behaviors are. Sustainable means you can keep doing this and have no serious problems. Okay? And that's an installation. But you don't see it as a series of constraints. Rather, you see it as a sort of phenomenological tunnel opening you a path of possibilities to reach your goal. That's how we see it. We don't feel that as constraint. We feel that as it's the natural way to go. Okay? And this installation will funnel the activity of the subjects. This is how we get channeled. We have installations and we naturally get in the fold. So you may say this is, this is a bit weird in uh, epistemological terms because uh, affordances are something about realism, uh, phenomenology rules this uh, embodied uh, area and then the social is more constructionist. This is absurd in scientific terms but it does work. Things like this, which are compounds, which are epistemologically unclean, and, uh, well, they make sense. They are natural units of behavior for us. And that's probably one of the reasons why installations have always been cut between several disciplines, and we always see them through only one slice. Regulations, embodied, embodiment by psychology, things like this. Okay? So here's my takeaway currently. Uh, installations are specific local societal settings where subjects are expected to behave in a predictable way. They do channel individual behavior by providing a limited choice. This choice is limited by three layers of components, the physical affordances, the embodied competences, and the social institutions. These determinants provide support but also control. They provide feed forward, they provide feedback also. But they assemble only at the point of delivery where they operate as a behavioral attractor. The elements of this conference were assembled at 6.30, right? No conference without a room. The room was always there, but you weren't here. I wasn't here. And there was no um, institutional space before 6.30, okay? But that worked very well. We are performing what is a conference. I don't mean a good conference. I mean, we're performing now. It looks like a conference, feels like a conference, okay? All of us in a distributed manner, even though there's some people I don't know here in this room, but we manage, okay? Is that clear so far? Yeah? All right. Now let's look at how these installations work in practice and show us how society is fluidly operating with these things. As I said, installations provide uh, scaffolding, empowerment, and guidance, but also constraints, self-control, and coercion. And uh, through these uh, three layers, which are both supportive and limiting, as a matter of fact, installations can be quite complex, much more complex than these uh, rough Pac-Mans that I've been showing you. There's, there's lots of, lots, lots of detail. Life is made of a thousand, a million of details. It's very, very detailed. And uh, let us have a, a bit of a zoom in it. This is actually the, the picture from the cover of the book. Um, and the man who made the, the drawing, uh, Pierre-Emmanuel Godet, Try to show all the little artifacts and people here or the thoughts that uh, canalize us, channel us into doing something. I'm going to take an example from a hospital here, a Danish hospital, the medication room. So this is just to explain you what the medication um, is about, medication round. So here, the nurse sees the prescriptions on her software, right? And the prescriptions tell her what she has to do to, we, to, to give to which patient and when. And she prepares small cups with the label that she prints. She goes onto the shelves and gets the right uh, medication. 
She puts the right amount in each of these little cups, right? She puts the cups on a tray, and then she goes in the hospital to deliver these medications to the patients. Is that clear? Roughly like a postman, okay? What I'm going to show you is the small moment when she leaves the medication room and she enters the patient's room, and we're going to see at what various layers of that installation support and scaffold something that's very important in hospitals, which is the sanitation. Cleaning, sterilizing, so to avoid nosocomial infections, okay? So look carefully at what happens, and you'll see that things happen at several layers in, at the same time. So here we go. It's annoying, isn't it? Okay, you've been a Danish nurse for three minutes and 25 seconds, and you start realizing what it means going from the lab to the field, okay? And human action is much more complicated than just a couple of intentions that you can get on the questionnaire. Objects play a very important role in other people too, although we, we didn't see. This is a simple scene. There's very few interhuman interaction, okay? Now, if you look at this scene, you will notice that this uh, sanitation is reminded to the nurse by the presence of the very sanitation, the, the, the station with the, the cleaning thing, when she goes out. It is reminded to her by the system. 
It is reminded to her, which is rules. It is reminded to her by her own training internally, okay? And you see that the action, which is very complex, she has to clean. There's a lot of very, a series of very complex operations that, that are, are, are done. These things can be done only because she is scaffolded at every moment by something that reminds her what to do and helps her and prompts her to do the, the, the proper things. Does that make sense? Right. And you can imagine the amount of work that is behind this, the construction of all these things, the design, the training of the nurse, the institution of all these rules. They go back to the works of Pasteur, right? They go back to the first people who understood what it was, to the, the, the fact of washing hands, they made statistics and they realized that after surgery then these patients died less of, of infection, all right? This is a cultural, social, historical, cultural construction that conspires to make what happens at what at one moment on an everyday basis in every hospital in Denmark and, and the rest of the world. This is how society enables this nurse who is very smart but was born with a you know, Stone Age mind to perform this extremely complicated series of operations on a daily basis almost seamlessly, right? Without taking any decision. She's channeled all the time. This is automatic, all right? And we have the nurse, and we have the surgeon, and we have the patient, etc. These are how installations enable our complex societies to work, to operate. Let me show you how resilient they are. This is another part, right? When the nurse goes and takes the medication, she will have to scan it so that the system checks that the medication that she's putting in the little cup matches what is on the prescription. So there's a barcode. So she takes this. And she looks at where the barcode is, and then she puts the barcode under the machine. And so it should say beep, and then take that thing. It doesn't beep. It stays red. The nurse is smart, right? She knows that every medication must have a barcode. So there's a problem here. Maybe that is not the right barcode. So she looks here on the packaging, and she turns the packaging all around until she finds another barcode on the outer package. She scans it, beep, that's good, okay? What happened? There was a failure in one of the layers, okay, on the physical affordances. But because the redundancy, the nurse was checking all this and with her brain she found a solution to solve the problem. The installation was resilient. Here it was resilient to a technical fault. Okay, let, let me give you another example. Um, the resilience to so social regulation can come through many, many ways, right? I've listed quite a few in the book. I'll just show you how through instruction and guidance here, this can happen. So now the patient, the, the nurse is in the room and she goes to the patient, she takes the medication the procedure says that she has to scan the bracelet, the barcode of the patient, to check that she's giving the right medication to the right patient. Why? Because sometimes patients change rooms, right? And so she takes the, the barcode of the, the bracelet on the patient, she scans it, that's fine, she gives the medication. But this is a rookie, this is a novice patient. And a novice patient, just as we would do when we go in the transport with our oyster card, we you know, badge in when we come in and we badge when we come out, the patient presents again the bracelet, but it's not necessary. The patient has been checked. So what the nurse does is she gently takes the hand of the patient and she puts it back and she explains, no, we don't need to do that a second time. What happened here? We had a novice who didn't have the competence, but what happened is that through here, instruction of guidance, third layer, social control. She executed the proper movement. No need to present the barcode again. So the installation funneled her in doing the proper thing, okay? So now she has learned. That patient has embodied the competence just because she went through the installation and the installation forced her into getting the proper behavior. So what we had is actually we had a learning effect 
Okay? This installation operated as a teaching uh, station. Let me show you another example. The vigilante effect. Once we get to know how things work down here, we actually become uh, guides and sometimes a bit vigilantes to other people who don't operate properly. Let me give you an example, personal example. The book is full of personal examples, some embarrassing, I must say. Not this one, this one's okay. There's more about my sex life and stuff like that. I'm saying this because I know the students are interested, so maybe they're going to try to read and find the place where it's near the end, you have to read the whole book. Anyway, <laughs> but, right. So I was at a black tie event at LSE. So at a black tie event, uh, you have to be dressed with a black tie coat, which means that you must have a tuxedo, black bow, tie, and all the other things that go with it. And I was like that, I was very proud. It was my first black tie event. And so I meet one of my colleagues from the department. I will withhold the name. Um, and so that colleague compliments me, says, oh, well, nice tuxedo, Sadi, very nice. And then she tells me, oh, mm, but you know, you should not use a pre-knotted bow tie. You should learn how to knot it yourself. So she was pointing at the fact that I lacked this specific uh, competence, <laughs> which I must admit I still lack today. So installation has not always work. That's another uh, story. So uh, what I showed you here is that the redundancy of uh, the structure of the installation produces resilience, which means that even if you're an incompetent participant, you will be folded into doing the proper behavior you will be channeled even if you're novice and sometimes even if you're reluctant. And as a consequence, you learn in doing. You execute the proper behavior. You are socialized by installations into the proper cultural skills. And this is how society reproduces. I'm showing you here just a little bit of the book on how in some cases the, you know, the embodied layer is reproduced, but it's just the same thing for the other layers. Basically, the two other layers always help reproducing the one that is faulty or needs to be renewed. Okay? This is how it works. You have, like, uh, you know the process of, of die casting. You have some kind of a mold, you put the blank, you press, and you have a final product that has the appropriate shape. That's a bit how society does with installation. You take a rookie, you get him or her through the installation, and they come out with the appropriate competence. How does this happen? Very simple. It is uh, a way of creating these competencies that will be necessary for you in your daily life, and you've got thousands of them. You know how to operate in a train station, you know how to operate with tea, you know how to operate in conference, lots of other things, right? And, uh, we use a very simple uh, characteristic of all animals, which is that we are sensitive to operant conditioning. Right? Good results, we tend to reproduce. Bad results, we don't reproduce. So what happens is you get through the installation, you're fed forward to doing the right thing. You get reward, social reward, or just getting your goal so you're happy. And then you have embodied the proper competence. We make sure here that people don't come with the wrong goals, we stop them, okay? And we can be very severe as a society to avoid bad behaviors being performed in public space. Especially in public space because that could be a very bad example because people don't only learn by action, they also learn by observation, okay? And so this is the way, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, how uh, we embody uh, competences and uh, this is through installations, by being fed into that process through installations. And this is what uh, some of my colleagues have called the dispositions of the habitus. Uh, this is Bourdieu, the schemes of perception and appreciation deposited in their incorporated state in every member of the group. So now we see how they get these. They don't get this just by the miracle of culture. They get this by practice on an everyday basis of installations. And this is why we are able, because we all practice in similar installations, to have what we have seen a while ago, is that we all embody similar skills, okay, in a given culture. Right. So 
If I come back to a quick abstract of the literature, which I'll be very quick on because you probably all know it, we know that in society, practices and representations reproduce each other, right? This is what Berger and Luckmann, Bourdieu, Giddens, for example, uh, told us. That during social interaction, individuals learn how to behave properly, okay? That they acquire a common knowledge that is about local practices, that knowledge is typical of the local culture, that this knowledge is embodied in individuals and expressed in symbolic format. And finally, that in situ, these skills, embodied skills, combined with mediation structures, distributed in the context, produce practices. And this is what uh, distributed cognition, situated action tell us. So this is a sort of brief abstract of the recent literature on what produces behavior and how societies reproduce. And I think that now you can see that the role of installations is actually very important in that system. It is a distributed way of producing embodiment in all these humans in a given society. And this is how practice reproduces content and structure. We've known that in theory at the general level. What my point is here tonight is that the way it happens in practice and in the detail is through installations. Okay? So, as a takeaway, installations enable fluid societal operation on the fly, right? As we have seen. And that behavior is appropriate. It's predictable, it, cooperation is possible, and externalities are controlled. That's how societies, how societies operate smoothly. But then, this these installations also enable social societal reproduction in the long run because what participants embody or what is reinforced in their competences to perform appropriate behavior is valid for the long run. What that patient has learned is not just doing right on that day. She will do right on every future day in the same installation. And when you learn how to cue in one specific line, you will have the competence to queue in every line, okay? That's why it's so efficient. You can learn in any of these installations what a conference is, and once you have learned in, in any of these installations, it's valid for any other. That's the magic of societal standardization and learning through practice, okay? I, alas, do not have the time to go in detail through all this. What I, I, I used 10 slides for is 100 pages and hundreds of examples by the book, okay? But, uh, <laughs> but I mean, I'm already going over, over time, so it, I'm getting to my last uh, point. Evolution and how can we do intervention, right? With the same brain, we have been able to evolve considerably. So these installations are not static. They're changing all the time, okay? Let me take the example of road traffic. This is the number of fatalities per 100 million vehicle miles of travel, okay? That was in 1950, and that is now, okay? There is progress. How do we get there? We change the artifacts, okay? We change the, 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 the physical layer. These things, roundabouts, have much less points of possible accidents than the classic crossroads, okay? But also, we will, for every activity change not only the devices, but we will improve the other layers that we will operate training and we will have regulations on how to use these things. All these things evolve as a bundle. Of course, the regulations of traffic have evolved with the nature of cars and roads, okay? When you have roundabouts, you create new rules for roundabouts, right? Evolution is a generation of new variants and then selection. In the natural world of biology, what happens is a single selection system, trial and error. Some animals are more efficient, the most efficient survive, the other ones disappear, okay? Culture is different. Culture has a dual selection system that operates actually in installations. Physical trial and error, just like here, people will, for example, choose the best products and the, the other ones, they will not survive on the market. But every product has been also selected in thought experiments, 
in drafts, okay? in simulations, in the marketing or R&D department. And as a matter of fact, this is much more efficient and less costly. For 3,000 raw ideas, only about four to 10 are actually tried in the real world, okay? Which means that more than 99% of the trials happen in symbolic simulation, okay? We don't have to risk the life of, of every new object. We try them out in symbolic format. This is why we're so much more efficient as a culture than nature is. And what happens is that for every artifact that we do, and I'm, you're taking here the example of physical ones, but it's true for the other ones too, they exist always in two forms. They exist in reified form, physical, and in symbolic form, right? And what we do is first we, we match always these symbolic forms. We make a representation out of objects and we make objects out of representations. People don't make hats out of nothing. They make hats because of, from the idea of a hat, from the representation of a hat. But where do you get the representation of a hat from? From knowing real hats. This is a chicken and egg cycle, okay? But then we have selection here in the symbolic form with simulation tests, Gedanken experiments, okay? Things that do not uh, operate well in the simulation are not even tried out. For example, we will not try to make um, hats out of baby skin, human baby skin. It's considered that it's not a proper material. Although technically it will work, but culturally, I know, too many externalities. Uh, okay. And then we try them out uh, in refined form. They must test, they must stand the reality tests. And everything that survives in our organizations, in, in our culture, goes through these two things and exists in two formats, reified and symbolic. And then this cycle is supervised by institutional control. Institutions make sure that this is conformed to cultural norms, like we shouldn't use baby skin, um, and we make sure that it's compliant uh, with the regulations uh, here, that it will withstand, for example, the fall of a brick. Okay? This is how things operate. I can't get too much in the detail, but I didn't want to frustrate you of the second half of the book. That's in there, okay? And in, as a matter of fact, it's a bit more complex than that because installations are not isolated. There are three layers, but the components of the layers do not exist only in one single installation, okay? They exist in other installations. You know, people make chairs here, but not only for conference rooms. They use them in other places, right? And depending on what happens to them in other places, the design may have been influenced. Another interesting thing that actually circulates from installation to installation is, um, perhaps you have a guess. Humans. Humans go from installation to installation like pollinizing bees and then they learn something here and then they will come somewhere else and, and you know, try to use it. Like I, I know at home I learned that it's, it's nice to eat uh, fair trade coffee huh? for lots of reasons and then I go to the coffee and I order a fair trade coffee. And, uh, and so uh, at the 10th person asking for that, the, 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 you know, the, the owner of the cafe thinks well, maybe I should sell fair trade coffee, there seems to be clients. And this installation has been modified because of that, because some elements are moving from one to another. And therefore, of course, there will be a whole series of trade-offs and power struggles because interests are different, okay? Different stakeholders, different installations. And this is where institutional control comes in to arbitrate between these different uh, you know, interests. And then they're using values to do this, okay? Should we... Uh, change this because it's uh, nicer on this scale, like it's uh, more ethical, or on this scale, like it's more efficient, okay? Um, different places, different currencies uh, have uh, value, right? Love and care is important in family settings. Efficiency is more important uh, in industry, etc., etc. okay? I don't have the time, alas, to go through all this, but this is how installations naturally evolve and there are a series of mechanisms that we can use to tweak their evolution. But before that, a quick takeaway, 
evolution follows a betterment loop with gradual improvement with that cycle and with a dual selection and evolution, symbolic and reality experiment. This evolution is monitored by institutions which uh, take into account uh, power struggles and values. All the layers are involved in evolution. These installations evolve as bundles because they are evaluated on the result of activity, which is a result of their coalescence, okay? And they are crossed in pact between installations. And finally, what can we do to change? Right. There are many ways. I'm just showing you one here. Um, follow the activity you're interested in at every step and try to figure out where it's problematic, where there's danger, where it rubs, where there's dissatisfaction, where there's failure, and try to figure out what is the problem at hand, okay? And then you can try to address this, right? You can try to address this by various means, by other layers. This is what we've been doing, for example, for 10 years in this, in this lab. We've been testing new ways of work, new installations for, uh, for example, conferences. Um, and uh, I detail that in the book. Uh, for example, we, we look, I show in detail how a specific installation for making conferences uh, has evolved over time. At that time when we started, that was in early 2000, there was no such thing as these large uh, sensitive whiteboards that you can write on. So we designed these things and uh, we came through a, a series of, of issues to do this. And we saw how we could modify the activity by working on the different layers, right? And these things are now distributed uh, all over. The Another example where we tried to modify the water intake of uh, small children, three to six, uh, because they don't drink enough water and then they drink too much soft drinks and then they become obese, etc. So we, I, I will not go into the detail, but we had uh, with my colleagues here an experiment on different installations where we did operate just on one layer or two layers or three layers. And to make a long story short, uh, three layers, we multiplied by seven the water intake. It's not so spectacular because the control in the same time, we observed them for a whole year, all was multiplied by three. But that's still a massive effect compared to classic uh, policies, all right? Another uh, final uh, little uh, example here um, of how uh, we can use these techniques just to find what are the best practices that people have naturally evolved into. This is work by uh, my colleague Marina Avery. She's probably in the room somewhere. Uh, yes, and uh, she observed uh, uh, some issues that some of you may be familiar with, is that the use of uh, all these kinds of devices by adolescents, by adults also, by the way. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, don't laugh. I'm sure that a lot of you have the same problems and not just with your children. I personally do have this, this kind of addiction. But anyway, uh, this is interesting because looking at these tapes, of course, uh, because we do this with the adolescents and they try to solve their problem. They're very creative and they're very self-conscious and, and it's, it works quite well. But also this enabled to find a series of installations that some families have found that enable avoiding that kind of situation, right? And transferring things. So it's not just about the design that you make yourself, you can just find out natural solutions out there. Finally, and these are I think my last uh, two uh, slides, to change behavior, you can follow the activity with CB or any other technique, whatever. Each turning point, you focus on the critical components, okay? You look at what lay, what's the major layer involved, and then you can work on that layer. So we have three types of, of intervention. We have design, we work on the artifacts, we work on the affordance layer, physical world. 
We can work on the embodied competences with training, and we can work on the social regulation with the rules. Okay? Most of what governments do is, is usually just trying to send out some communication or hope that there will be uh, training, but uh, we see that here we have a lot of possibilities that we can use and we should just be very opportunistic in what we have at hand because of course we can move the behavior by any of the three layers. It just depends on what you can do at that moment. And my advice, redesign with the stakeholders, okay? Uh, as my uh, friend Volker Hartkopf says, what, what you should not do things for the people. What you do for the people, you do to the people. You should do things with the people. And usually they know better, right? And anyway, they will be the stakeholders who implement. So you'd better have them on your side. Okay, final takeaway. Many behaviors on everyday life are channeled by installations. You've seen what installations are. Three layers, affordances, embodied competences, social regulation. Installation theory, I hope I have uh, convinced you of this, provides a very pragmatic framework uh, to analyze and do intervention on these uh, installations. Beyond that, in terms of like, social science theory, we see that the redundancy of these layers does make installations resilient and that this resilience has very interesting properties. First, it enables societal reproduction in practice even when the participants are novice or incompetent or reluctant or whatever. We force in it to a bit, you know, we funnel, right? Other very interesting thing is that because of that, societies actually can reproduce through installations, through the very functioning of society it reproduces. But it doesn't reproduce as a block. It, repro it reproduces piecemeal, right? There are right now in the UK, thousands of conference rooms which are operating training of participants of how to behave in a conference, whether sitting there or whether talking at, at, you know, at the lectern, okay? There are currently millions of training stations of installations that are reproducing society. And each of them locally evolves and gets better and gets better. I've been in this conference room 10 years ago. It was not as good as now. A lot of the features have much improved, okay? Right. And the way the installations evolve are through a dual selection process, material and symbolic. The way this place has evolved is not they haven't been trying all the things by hand and see if it works. They've thought about it, okay? And then they test it. And this process is much more efficient than Darwinian selection probably a thousand times more efficient and less risky. And in that process, because there is institutional monitoring, this is not a I mean, struggle for life with the, the survival of the fitter. Values and the power struggles are taken into account by stakeholders. We have governance, and that's very important. Okay? And finally, Interventions should be designed with the stakeholder. I think this is politically very important and not only technically efficient. Thank you very much. <laughs> I've been too long. <laughs> yes, yes. Sadi, you, can you hear me? Yes. Sadi, thank you very, very much indeed for that enormously clear and really so easy to follow explanation of uh, a, a fascinating methodology, but also the development of a really complex uh, theoretical framework for, that, that has implications uh, that go uh, in, in so many different directions. Um, and also from, from your presentation, it's clear, which is also clear in the book, of the truly international base of your experiments and the data um, that you've gathered. Um, I've got... With my colleagues. With your colleagues, yes, over a considerable period of time. We are, we are a bit restricted for time, so although I've got lots of fascinating things to ask you myself, I can do that afterwards. Let's go to the floor straight away and see if there are, uh, are any questions. Can we take one or two... 
as, as you, um, we'll, one there, if we've got microphones, we'll take a couple of questions at a time if there's uh, anybody else who wants to, and the, the, on there, yes, and, and Paul. So that's three of you. If you could say who you are, where you come from, and, and, and as, keep your question as concise as possible, that would be great. One, two, three, one. Uh, well, my name is my name is Federico. Uh, I come from Mexico. I did the masters in social and cultural psychology, and my question refers uh, about the possibilities of using installation theory to understand consistent behavior that seems to contradict one of the layers of the installation. For example, how can it use to be to explain smoking when it seems to contradict the social uh, institutional level? and also the subjective uh, embodied um, competency level. So, so should we just take, take the three? Uh, um, I'm Grania. Um, I'm a recovering postdoc in neuroscience. Um, I'm kind of related, actually. I was wondering if you um, could comment on how you, uh, the installation theory would intersect with um, pathological conditions, you know, uh, in, I'm thinking psychiatric conditions or uh, social p people with social um, abnormalities. Mm -hmm. Yes, psychosocial problems. Yes, and Paul. So uh, my question is: There's clearly been a uh, an evolution of understanding of the human mind, and in particular, how we're driven by automatic and unconscious processes, and in particular, how some of those unconscious processes lead us to make mistakes in some of our decision making. So I just wondered um, where and how that fits into installation theory. I'd be in interested to hear what, what you have to say about that. Thank you. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, so, so what you're pointing at is that um, installations do not control everything and are not perfect. Okay. Uh, there is a continuous process of uh, society precisely trying to address these things. Smoking has been a problem for a very long time, right? And you see that now there has been a huge effort into uh, making it very, very difficult, okay? Uh, I, I, actually, it's an example I take in the book about how the French cafes have evolved uh, about this to take into account these regulations of la loi et vin, which uh, banned smoking. And you must have, for those of you who are smokers or have been smokers, you must have seen the efficiency of a lot of installations in, in reducing your capacity to, to do so. But of course, it is not perfect. It's work in progress. You see what I mean? That society is trying to limit a series of things, but it will not ever succeed to do everything. It's just, and just one thing, every theory is limited. Installation theory is about how people behave predictably in certain settings, okay? It's not going to explain everything like how you walk in the woods or stuff like that, all right? It's just how, how this is done and how you can actually use that theory to make people conform, right? That's, that's what happens. In terms of, of, um, of uh, pathology, uh, and, and this goes also with this question, there may be at higher level in societies issues with conflicting values. Uh, uh, Paulus Yamin, who is, is working on, on the Colombian uh, civil service, I mean, notes very aptly that there are some contradictions about the value of, of you know, in some places it, it is good actually to, 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 to be a, a villain, right? Because you can protect your family, so it's good. drug dealer is, is, is actually a, a role model. This is, people have to go with these two conflicting uh, things that are some of their competences that they have learned are not efficient because it does, the installations don't work well. So, I mean, don't blame it on, 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 on the theory. It's just a way of analyzing what's problematic. And that's exactly what, what they're doing in Colombia, trying to align these things. And, and uh, finally, this, this issue of uh, mistakes and, uh, and well, Basically, heuristics, right? Um, what's a mistake? And that's, that's probably Gigerenzer's point. What's a mistake in one context may not be a mistake in another one, okay? So the heuristics that we have developed were probably very efficient when we were designing our brain as, as, you know, as, as a, uh, uh, you know, primates a few hundred thousand years ago. And now these things can become mistakes in the complex 
uh, settings that, that, that we have. Um, our problem is precisely to deal with the fact that we have um, maladapted uh, basic human material. We are trying to make societies of ants or termites with millions of people concentrated in towns with creatures that, I mean, like running in the wild and, and, uh, and, and not being you know, squashed in, in, in a tube at 6 p.m. And so it is inevitable that a lot of what we have designed as our nervous system or brains or emotions will produce very strange results in such crazy environments. So either we come back uh, or uh, we try to redesign uh, re and, and I mean, re-engineer genetically the human beings, which is also a possibility, or we continue in the way that we have done as in more and more controlling installations. And when you think of it, our, uh, our life is probably much more channeled in complex societies than it was a few hundred years ago, but, but, but now we also go to the moon. So we, 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 you know, it's always, it's the classic trade-off between a, a free will and, and the social contract. Mm. Thank you. Other question, one over there, one down here, number two, another one, three there. Right. So. Uh, uh, Tom Reader, LSE. Uh, Sadly, this is a question I've asked you before, um, but it, I find it very interesting. Is, are some, some societies better at installation theory than others? And actually, are authoritarian societies very good at installation theory? So I'm kind of thinking of um, you know, very, very dictatorial societies where they, they, they're very good at regulating how we think, at creating structures for controlling behavior. And kind of your program, there's a sort, there is a sort of, there's a good side to it in that you can change behavior positively. There's also quite a, a dark side to it as well. I'd just like to get your kind of comments on that. Okay, thank you. And second, second question. Yes, thank you, Saji, for your lecture. Uh, in a way, my question follows a bit because your, your theory, th there is a touch of it that reminds me of Walden too. Okay, Skinner, Walden too. And I know it's not that because you have studied activity and not behavior. So I wanted to ask you, out of the studies, what is the space that you find for the subjectivity of individuals to contest installations and perhaps explode them or continue messing about with them so that, you know, we don't end up the prisoners of too much of a technocratic vision that while efficient and able to uh, funnel behavior is also producing an element of dystopia and danger to uh, what we in psychology would like to consider the freedom of human consciousness expressed mainly in the imagination, in the property of the imagination. Mm, fascinating. And third question. Yeah, so the, uh, Martin Bauer, a colleague uh, in psychology. I think it is very interesting to hear this uh, in, in one go because the conversation obviously we had uh, or, or many years about this. But it, there is a kind of a sense of a, of a technocratic vision of the world. When you talk about changing the installation, you're basically talking about how the installation continues more efficient or more effective. And you could clearly say efficiency is a scandal, it's waste. And effectiveness is kind of, it makes what it does. But how do installations die? How does the traffic installation from horses and carriages move to petrol-driven institutions? And now we are having this enthusiasm about artificially intelligent-driven installations. How is this happening? In, in Swiss Allemand, uh, we talk about the installateur. Mm. That's a plumber, okay? So there is somebody kind of who makes the fluid going and we get the plumber in if the fluid is not the way it should flow, flow, okay? I mean, it's blocked. But where does the installation theory get the idea from of what the installation should do? Uh, How does it deal with the, in the, in the, con the, I mean, the incalcitrance, the, the yeah. non-conformity? Mm. I mean, wh where, where is the spirit of non-conformity, okay? 
Well, thank you for your yeah. question. I mean, I, lo I love being here. <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> okay. Um, right. Um, you know, one of my fears, Tom, is, is actually that a dictator reads that book. Okay? Uh, because th this is the manual of the perfect little dictator. Uh, now, that is not my intention. I am just, <laughs> I'm just trying to show how things actually work. You know, we are all brainwashed to a degree that is hardly imaginable. Look what we have our children get through. It takes 20 years almost to <laughs> format somebody enough to let them free in society, right? And look how hard we are with, with, with our kids, right? We are very far from the state of nature, right? Now, do some societies get better or not at it? History seems to show that if you want to go too far in limiting the freedom, it doesn't hold. Fortunately, right? But how far does it go? How far can we go? I don't know. We just have to be very vigilant. And we have to be vigilant, not necessarily on the level of control, because unfortunately, if you want to live 10 billions on this planet, we will have to have a lot of societal control. But at least perhaps we could choose together what control we want. That was my point, do it with the users. Unfortunately, we will have to have a very strong social contract because you can't cater 10 billion people by letting everybody do what they want. It's the sad story, right? I'm just being objective. I don't like it, right? But I have to, I can't be in denial. That's what happens. Let us at least, in terms of governance, choose the type of prison that we have constructed for ourselves, right? Is that a technocratic vision of the world or not? Um, I don't know. And do we have leeway? The control system is very smart. It doesn't say anything about what you think or what you feel. In the plane, as long as you behave as an airline passenger or in the tube or in the bus, you can think anything. You can think you want to smash the head of your neighbor. You can think of your past. You can think of dystopias, utopias, whatever, as long as you behave, OK? So this is what we have. And we have two choices. The first choice is when you're in an installation, you have a bit of leeway. I mean, you can sit like this or like this and think whatever you want. That's fine, OK? That's a bit of local leeway. The other leeway is that you can choose your installation. You can choose to go to church or not go to church. Okay, but if you even if you're an atheist, you go to church, you you'll uh, you'll comply. You won't start dancing or whatever. It's a religious religious service, and if you don't comply, people will make you understand more or less kindly that this is not a way to behave. So, this is it. The problem is that it's 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 a dilemma. Why do we go in these installations? Why the hell do we take the tube? Uh, well, uh, we want to go somewhere. <laughs> You see what I mean? It, it's always a trade-off, like, you know, it, it, it's not the way I want it, but uh, it helps me to do what I want a little bit. This is our life, trade-offs continuously. It's not happy. I, I'm not the carrier of good news in terms of analyzing, right? I'm just giving you, like, uh, what we found was a good way of looking at what, what kind of determinants we have. But now, now we have a clear knowledge, practical, we can at least see what we are ready to accept or not. But, it, but it's there. And uh, uh, Martin, you, your question is, is actually, it's fascinating. It's, what is a better world, okay? What, what, uh, uh, what, should, what should installations do? Which one should we make die? Which one should we foster, okay? And now we fall on the problem of values, okay? The question is, there are many ways of thinking that something is better than another, and we do not have all the same criteria, and we ourselves do not have the same criteria depending on the place, okay? So in some situations, I will think value is, is, is inefficiency. In others, it will be in fame. In others, it, it will be in care, okay? There, it's, it's, um, there has been a series of people who worked on this, so 
Talcott Parsons, Generalized Media of Communications, uh, Niklas Luchmann, uh, and then Boltons Kianteveno with the, the um, uh, economics of worth. Okay? And the idea is as follows. In a given situation, there are some types of resources that make the activity better okay? for everyone. Okay? Like in family, love and care. Those who bring that in, it's positive. So they're valued. If you're caring and loving in a family, you're great. Okay? In an organization like a company, if you're efficient, you're great. Okay? Commerce, you make a lot of benefit, you're great. Uh, media, a lot of fame, you're great. Why? Because these things are actually efficient. If you have fame, if you've got many followers, you are worth something on, on the eyeball market, and you're worth something in the media. If you're efficient, you're worth something in, 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 the, in an organization. But now, if, if, you're the, if you're the government, right, and if you have to arbitrate between all these things, how do we know what is better? The easy solution for governance is to take one single Weltanschung and to say, okay, we'll operate only by the value of, say, religion that has been for centuries. Okay. Religion is, is, is the law, is, we'll operate by this. Very simple criteria, just one criterion, no, 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 no conflict. Then it becomes something different and it becomes ethics, philosophy. Okay? Governments, long time have been that. Okay. Now it's economics, efficiency. Right? What's the next experience? Okay. Now, not at all. Not at all. It's just that I'm studying uh, cu current installations, and it seems that in current installations, the zeitgeist is about more efficiency, more comfort, etc. But you know, I've, I'm studying family dinners. Okay. For example, in, in the book, family dinners are not about efficiency. <laughs> completely different. Right. It, it's an, okay. I'm, no, sorry. Damn, I asked you. I'm very Beat conscious. me on the head when no, no, I'm no, no. talking too I'm much. No, but, well, it's I'm very conscious of the time, but there are some people who still want to ask okay. questions. So we'll take one more round. One mm -hmm. over there, one here, and one other. Okay, just those. Yep, third one there. Also, and it's really nice to be here and hear you talk. Um, I, when, I, when I was listening to your work, and obviously you know that I know your work and, and the technology that you use, so I want to turn to some kind of methods questions a little yes. bit, because I find your work so interesting. But for me, your work, and the, even the name of the technology, is about subjectivity, about subjective experience. And for me, in our talk, in the you know, discussion here, there's this tension for me between your focus on subjective experience and an individual or a, or a networked experience and this sense of uh, control and, and kind of system. And also the kind of three key elements that you're talking about in an installation of embodiment, affordance, um, and uh, I've forgotten now the name of the other layer. Fine. So they, 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 they really resonate with me around kind of work to do with Tim Mingold and the sort of work around sensory ethnography, and which really does talk to subjective and sensory experiences. So I just wondered if you could talk us through some of the kind of ways in which you're thinking about individual subjective experiences in this kind of work you're, you're doing. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the subjectivity issue, there was a quick question here, yes? Adam Moy, MSC student last year. Um, I, I like installation theory, Sadi. I think it's great, really hugely a powerful analytical tool, as you've outlined. But if I could take it back to the philosophical sort of area, um, do you, does randomness have any place in installation theory? And, and I'm thinking that, you know, increasingly, you know, we might see randomness as being such a huge force in, in sort of societal construction these days. And, you know, one might say our relationship with the environment in the planet is the ultimate installation. Um, what place might randomness have in, in explaining how society moves forward? Good, thank you. Randomness, and then there's, yes, very quickly. And I'm, I do understand that we are going a bit over time, so people may be leaving. And I'm, we'll, but we'll. Um, yeah, just. Hello. That's fine. It's working. Okay. Um, uh, my name is Emil Briley. I study uh, journalism at University of the Arts London. Um, my question is: uh, Do you think that in certain people, so let's just say, like people with autism, that maybe one of the three sort of installations aren't 
sort of present. So, so um, if let's just say like a, an autistic person goes into uh, like a public space, uh, and and you know there's like loud noise everywhere, and like mm -hmm. they'll they'll react in like a a way that we wouldn't deem to be acceptable. Like why why do you think that would occur? Do you think there's something that's fundamentally deficient? Or, or, or I'm going to have to stop you with the question because we, we are running out of time. But there's, so there's some question about uh, autism. autism yeah. Yeah. Okay. So as speedily as you can. So I, I, I will, I I will try to be, uh, to be very fast. OK, in, in the replay interviews, what we do is we try to, to match the uh, emic and etic perspective. What we do is not a classic thing. Oh, what happens? We discuss with the person until we have an explanation that is formally acceptable by the person and by us. So we negotiate that thing. Is that really the way you think it? Until, and, and when we agree on this, we think we have an acceptable you know, um, result. But we can discuss more about that. But that, that's, they are, are equal. We are not researcher yeah. and subject. We are two investigators looking at what happened. And it's very clear that after 10 minutes, they take over. They take the mouse, they stop, they, and they, they, they start explaining. We don't even ask anything. They start explaining to us what they're doing. OK, so that's how we do it. Um, Adam, randomness. I don't know how to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk around a glass, but I mean, this is too difficult, or I'm too tired, but we'll, we'll um, uh, OK. Um, and autism, uh, just the same. I mean, honestly, uh, it is a very complex and difficult issue. Uh, the, one of the problems that um, people who have mental issues in general, what we call mental issues, is that they seem not to be able to operate easily the same standard installations that we have. Okay, So perhaps different ones. It's, it's always the question of, we have created a massive norm that we are enforcing on a lot of people. And some people don't seem to be able to go through that as easily as, other, as others. We call these guys different or marginal or sick or whatever. It's just that they don't seem to adapt as well as the artificial conditions we have created. I'm not an expert in autism, but I think that there is at least one in this room. Uh, um, and I'll point him to you if you come for drink. Good. Well, look, thank you so much for all your fascinating questions and for being here tonight to mark this really special day, a launch of uh, a, a bringing together of work which has involved a lot of people, led by you, you Sadi, um, and taken place all over the world, and which it really is... A, and the book also is written in a terribly um, human way, just as we've heard this evening. It says, if you're really not interested in all this series, skip this next bit, da-da-da-da-da. Uh, but if you really want to get to the... It's very, very, very um, user-friendly, and um, it, we really, really appreciate all the work that's gone into it, even if we haven't read every single page. But, Sadi, uh, thank you very much indeed, and I'd like everybody to join me in thanking him. Thank you.